Hi, I'm Brent Johnson, and I am happy to be bringing you a new video today. This one is about an organ that is unlike anything else I've ever seen before. It's a 1924 Kimball built in Chicago with four manuals and 56 ranks. Much of it is very familiar. It has a classical console, uh, draw knobs, uh, and lots of familiar stop names, good English organ building style, but then there's all sorts of uh, theatrical things that are thrown in on top of it. Plus to mention just the layout of the draw knobs and where stops are is a little unusual for someone who was trained on a classical organ. The organ I'm talking about, of course, is in this building behind me, the Scottish Rite Auditorium in St. Louis. Now, if you're like I was some time ago, you don't know what the Scottish Rite is or why they need a big auditorium and a big organ. Well, hopefully by the end of this video series we'll answer all of your questions. But first, I've asked Dr. Stephen Ball to give us a little tour of this organ and to uh, play it for us and demonstrate the instrument a little bit. Now, it's a balmy late December day out here, uh, but when Stephen recorded this, it was a bit colder. The Scottish Rite Auditorium is heated by steam, and so uh, if you hear some noise in the background, you can blame those radiators and steam pipes.
1924 Kimball pipe organ in the St. Louis Scottish Rite Cathedral is one of the most unique and complex tonal designs ever produced by that firm. It shares characteristics of both a classical and a theatrical instrument. I say a feeder organ, I mean the feeder organs of that time. It's classical insofar as each manual division has a corresponding enclosure. Every division in this organ is enclosed. Uh, but it's theatrical because there are separate wind systems for many of the different stops. So there are 11 different tremulants, each tremulant affecting a separate uh, division of the organ, but also even within divisions, different types of tremulants. And there are tuned and untuned percussions. And so by virtue of this combination of worlds here, you have uh, a remarkable and complicated uh, tonal palette available to the performer whose disposition in the auditorium is not immediately obvious when you enter the building. That's the other thing. The organ is actually in three different locations. You could think of the classical part of the organ, if you will. The main organ is really to the left side of the proscenium arch. So all four manual divisions, the pedal for the most part, speak from the left side of the auditorium. There's an additional small antiphonal organ, which comprises five ranks to the right side of the proscenium arch. And in addition to that, there's another five ranks up in the ceiling, an echo organ. And strategically using these other divisions draws the sound of the main organ out into the room. It creates the illusion of uh, a much larger instrument, actually, than is really here. Because of the unification and the duplexing, most of what is here is in the manuals. There are some independent stops in the pedal, in the pedal division, but very few. And I'll give you a brief little tour of some of the musical resources here. First of all, uh, if you've seen photos of the council, you'll notice that there are five swell shoes uh, and then a six crescendo pedal. The original location of the swell shoes was determined by the position of these white tabs, which you can see above the solo keyboard. Uh, each setting the location of each one of those rectangles determined which shoe operated which box. And so it was possible to originally assign multiple boxes to a single shoe. Today that flexibility uh, doesn't exist and you see that the shoes are in fact assigned to individual locations. Starting with what is really the heart of this organ in the swell, you of course have a principal chorus, not in the strict sense of the word, it's all built on a diapason phonon. And then a smaller diapason which is this complement, the horn diapason. Actually, the smallest diapason scale wise in the organ, the next largest diapason being the choir division diapason. That's referred to as English diapason, and you'll see it's also duplexed into the grate, the principal diapason there. As a 16-foot complement, which is scale-wise smaller, that's the major diapason. And moving down two octaves, a four-foot octave. If those sounded similar, that's because it's the same set of pipes. It's unified at 16 and 4. So to put all of that together, using the 16, the 8, and the 4. And then on top of that, a 15th, which is independent. Compare that to the swell chorus, where we have the horn diapason. Four foot, octave. from the horn, and then the larger phonon diapason. So here's the eight and four horn diapason. The phonon above it. We add the two foot flute in the swell. Pairing that to the grate, you can see the swell is actually quite a bit more robust. And as we demonstrate the organ, you'll see actually that the swell is really the core of all the major ensembles here. And can, just by its own color, every, everything else going on in the ensembles. 
And then of course there's the diapason that is the largest scale in the organ, and that is the stentor diapason in the solo. Comparing that with all the other diapasons in the organ from the choir division, where we have the English diapason, to the great division where we have the principal diapason, the swell division where we have the phonon diapason, and the solo. Here I'll begin with the smallest in the choir, move to the swell, go to the great, then go to the solo. gives you an idea of some of the diapason sounds in the organ. In general, it's all very uh, dark and smoky in English. Talking a little bit about the strings in the organ, there are some wonderful string choruses. Again, the swell, which is really, as I said, the heart of the organ. You have the solutional. Solutional, by the way, is uh, an, uh, an old English word, I believe, that means willow flute. how effective the swell box is, now with its celeste. There's also a smaller scale string, a viol de orchestra. That has its corresponding celeste as well. That stop is unified at 16, 8, and 4. Give you an idea of what some of the 16 sounds like in playing it with its unification. There's a second 16-foot string in this organ, which is native to the pedal. It lives in the solo division, and it is a unified extension, or a duplex, uh, if you will, a duplex stop derived from this 8-foot cello. So that first to demonstrate the cellos in the solo organ. The 16 foot octave. The solo strings are the largest strings in the organ and can be played against, for example, the swell strings. So beginning with a small chorus of strings and building. A lot of brilliance in the strings here and in fact one of the mistakes that organists playing orchestral organs frequently make is to say that well there's really no mixtures or no upper work that create the brilliance in fact the trick of the brilliance is, is that it comes from the strings really there are a few other strings we didn't discuss the great gamba there's another string in the choir division the eight foot vi viol It does not have a Celeste, 
Frequently mistaken for a string is the dulciana. It's really considered by Audsley to be a principal or a family of the principal chorus, but it, like the strings, has a celeste, the undamaris, which is tuned flat, not sharp. Also in that same category of strings and flutes is the uh, beautiful uh, wald horn, which goes down to 16 foot in this choir division. Comparing that to the swell string, also at 16. Finally, the strings that are remote from the main organ, which we'll talk about when we demonstrate the antiphonal and echo organs. The next category of sounds to explore here is the lovely flutes. Really, the flutes in this instrument are the fundamental, they're the foundation that supports uh, everything. They have uh, all sorts of timbres based on how they're constructed. There are a wide variety of shapes, materials used by Kimball. Kimball in their day was the most expensive organ builder in the world, rank per rank. And by the time the firm closed the organ shop in 1930, they had produced organs in some of the most important venues in the world. This organ bears a great deal of similarity to the ballroom organ of Atlantic City, Boardwalk Hall, where I was the staff organist for several years. This instrument is more classical because it is confined to the traditional divisions we've been talking about of great swell choir solo. That instrument is more theatrical because all of those tonal resources, almost identical resources in terms of scaling, are confined to a main and a solo chamber. That's one of the primary differences structurally between what we now think of as a theater organ and a classical organ. Looking at some of the flutes, they're the flutes you'd expect in a classical organ, again starting with the swell, the gedecked. This stop is unified at 16, 8, 4, 2 and 2 thirds, 2 and 1 and 3 fifths. So it really has a great deal of uh, unification in the swell. The flute has a lovely celeste as well which is more, uh, uh, more diminutive, more like a dulciana in character, but a little bit larger. With the gedect. There's also a larger and more conspicuous flute. That's the tibia clausa, or closed uh, large-scale flute, which you'd expect to find in a theater organ. Just as in the early Hope Jones instruments, there's no tremulant on the tibia clausa. In this case, however, there's an independent wind system and tremulant provided by Kimball to give a more theatrical sound. As the wind system in this instrument hasn't been altered, you're hearing the original Kimball design for how the tremulant should sound. And this is also very consistent, for example, with the organ at uh, the Adrian Phillips Ballroom in Boardwalk Hall, which is what the original tremulant there on the tibia clause sounded like. Moving on to look at the flutes in the Great Division. The Great Division is built off of this 16-foot Borden and 16-foot major diapason. We've already heard the major diapason. Here's the Borden. As you can expect, of course, that's also available in the pedal. Next, we have a beautiful clarabella, an open flute with a back bevel on the mouth. And then a concert flute. 
The concert flute is actually duplexed to us from the choir division, so I'm going to move now and talk about the choir division flutes. Same type of flute, except harmonic, but also smaller scale. Again, a great deal of unification upwards on all of these stops. Finally, we have the solo division. Now, the solo division, we have the perfect tipping point between the flutes and the reeds, the final category that we did not talk about. The mellophone, which is an open flute sounding stop, really a large scale flute, is actually also the labial French horn. And so the difference between the, the mellophone, which is a flue or a whistle, and the French horn is very interesting to compare, and that will bring us into the category of the reeds. Doesn't sound much like a French horn now, perhaps. convincing. There are some other wonderful color reads here. The English horn, which Kimball was famous for at this time. There's a tuba chorus of great power. You have a 16. Unified at 16, 8, and 4. With its own tremolo. To play those together. Of course, the crowning reed of the organ, the tuba mirabilis. Then, of course, there's the most ridiculous inhabitant of the solo division of all, the canera. The canera is, if you have never seen one, a reed stop that has practically no resonator. Very, very short uh, speaking length reed, and it's commonly found in theater work. doesn't work very well on its own, but when you add, for instance, a four foot flute, you have a very useful color. There are other reeds as we move to a different keyboard. I'm going to choose now the swell division, probably the location where most people would think of reeds. We have a posan. There's an oboe, which is unified to 16, 8, and 4. And of course, a vox humana. The grate has its own separate reeds as well. There are three reeds in the grate chamber. They are the harmonic trumpet, the tromba, and then the, the pedal independent reed unit, which we'll talk about in a second. So the harmonic trumpet, first of all, and the tromba. And in addition to that, the 16 foot reeds of the pedal. Similar. That 16 foot pedal reed also goes down to 32.
Finally, a few more color reads to talk about. There's a beautiful clarinet, as you'd expect, in the choir. There's an orchestral oboe. This organ actually has two mixtures, although you only see one in the specification. The first is the soft mixture in the swell. You may have heard there's a major tierce in that, in that stop. It means, of course, it doesn't work so well with the diapasons, but with the reeds, it's wonderful. That's one of the reasons why major tierce mixtures were very popular in the 19th century. They thought of and used different mixtures for different things. The other mixture is an unlikely one, and that's the 64-foot stop. Playing down from the 32-foot contraborden, you'll hear it quint into the 64-foot. As you might imagine, the 32s and the 64 resultant in this case don't come through very well in a recording. We're actually moving the recording equipment with the sound waves and not really picking up much of anything to send you to the listener at home in your home audio system. So if you want the real thing, you really do have to come to the Scottish Rite to experience the full sonic impact of this organ in the room. It's quite impressive. There are two divisions of the organ we did not yet talk about. The most important of these, in some respects, is the antiphonal, which is located on the house right or stage left side of the auditorium. It occupies visually the same amount of real estate that you would uh, see in the main organ on the left side of the stage. However, it's a much smaller instrument. And really, there's only five stops there. So you have a flute, which is unified at 16, 8, 4, and 2. You have a diapason. You have a viola. And you have a horn, an oboe. So let's listen to what those stops sound like. First of all, here's the die pace. The gems horn. the Clarabelle flute. The viola. And the oboe.
if used strategically against the main organ, it can pull the sound into the room and be a very effective foil. The other division of the organ, which is remote from the main instrument, is the echo. The echo has a pair of strings, a unison and celeste, a fern flute, a vox humana, an oboe, and the chimes. We'll be getting to the percussions in just a moment, so stay tuned to that. First, let's listen to the strings. The flute. Vox humana. And the oboe. Again, if used strategically, it has a very magical effect in the whole ensemble of the organ in the room. This is a very difficult organ to play. The original dedication in 1924 involved three days of dedicatory recitals. Charles Corbron was brought in for the occasion. As you can imagine, having a large, nearly walk-in for manual console sitting on top of most of the major tonal resources of the instrument make it difficult or even impossible to do anything other than just imagine what the musical effects of these other somewhat powerful divisions in the room are. So you have to learn to play this instrument uh, in a very special way. It is actually among the most complicated tonal designs of any pipe organs I've ever encountered in my career. Of course, there are the things in this organ that make it more of a theater organ than a classical organ, or at least the things that people think make it a theater organ rather than a classical organ. But that's a complicated discussion for another day. But what I'm referring to, of course, are the percussions. Kimball percussions are somewhat unusual amongst their competitors insofar as they went to greater lengths than anyone else did to produce an actual orchestral effect. This instrument has six tuned orchestral percussions and they use, in most cases, Bakelite hammers, very similar to what the actual orchestral players would use. This is unlike other competitors. They also took great care in the case of some of them, especially the ones that have uh, more reverberation, such as the chimes or the harp, to provide dampers to actually mute the sound, which are controllable from spoons here at the council, in addition to a pianissimo or forte possibility. First, to begin with the metal bar percussions, we'll start with the celesta, which is in the swell. That's actually quite bright. The hammers have hardened over time. It's much more likely that the original sound of the instrument would have been softer uh, with less upper harmonic development. It sounds quite similar to its relative, which does have hard metal hammers, and that's the glockenspiel, which is located in the solo division. The wood bar percussions, again, have a soft hammer and a hard hammer. The soft hammer is the marumba harp. And then the hard hammer, the xylophone. In addition, in the percussion department, we have a piano, which is playable in the grate at eight and four. and then the pedal at 16. Finally, of course, there are the chimes, which in this case are located up in the echo division.
And then there are the untuned percussions, the things that raise the most eyebrows here for organists who haven't been warned. These are just what you'd expect in a Kimball theater organ. The castanets, tambourine, Chinese block. Note that it is a reiterating Chinese block that is original to Kimball design as well. Tom Tom, snare drum, cymbal, and then the bass drum which has both a roll and a strike. Finally, because of the nature of the very specific use of this instrument in the rituals of the Scottish Rite, there are special effects which are specific to the ritual. And some of these are located on the momentary tabs above the solo organ. From left to right, you have the Chinese gong. Birds located in the echo, the antiphonal, and the main. And to the far right, the very unusual bugle call, which has stop keys indicating the order in which the pitches, normally the harmonics that a bugle player would play, would play. So you don't even really have to know how to play a bugle to play this bugle. And of course, last but definitely not least, the triangle. My thank you to Stephen Ball for taking us through the organ. If you'd like to see inside the chambers, that's in our next video, which should be right up here. If it's not, you can find a link down in the description. I'll see you there.